Louise Mandel, presentation topic, The Chacolton Case and the Doctrine of Discovery. Elders, matriarchs, leaders, scholars, colleagues, friends, brothers and sisters, Dean Axworthy, if you're here. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the territory of the Sequetmuk, this beautiful land where we're having this important conversation, and great gratitude to the organizers of this important and timely conference and for inviting me here to speak, and great gratitude for you for, for being here. Um, those who know me well know that I'm quite directionally challenged. And the first case I argued was in an old courtroom in New Westminster. It was actually a breaking and entering charge. And um, the protocol is that you bow to, when you're done, you bow to the court, bow to the judge, you then leave. And, um, and I did that, I bowed, I was so grateful that I was finished and that I had got there on time. And I left, only when I opened the door, I found myself in a broom closet. I had, it was an old courtroom in New West, New West, I had just taken the wrong door. And because I was a young lawyer, I thought, well, um, maybe the best thing to do is just to wait till I don't hear any noise and then I'll sneak out. So I closed the door and I was in there for quite some time and I didn't hear any noise. So I decided I should come out. And when I came out, there was the judge and the accused and the court recorder and everybody was looking at me. And so I bowed and I left the courtroom. And, um, and, I, and I found my way out in this kind of gasp of, oh my God. And um, so I remembered that story because um, I was thinking about, well, how did I find you? How did I find myself here today? And I realized that I was swept up in a current of love, that I've spent my work life in the company of love, of people who I love and who love me too, with people whose ancestors told stories of love about the land passed down through the generations, people who lovingly named each bay and inlet, each river and mountaintop, every plant on the forest floor has a cultural story and a name. And I was taught as I've been working about this beautiful sacred connection, the sacred laws of love, I call them, and the connectedness I speak of, I learnt from your laws and your oral histories. And it's an ancient consciousness that the world is alive, that we're living members of a living body, all living things animated by the same life force, the spirit of love, the force of love, the creator that resides in each one of us. I, I listened to this beautiful um, creation story by um, the chief of Chehalis at a union meeting not long ago where he said that it's a creation story that goes something like this. Before there was a world, the sun and the moon had fallen in love, but they were separated in space and where their feelings met, earth was created. We're so privileged to have these stories. So I want to begin by um, moving with that idea into the work which I want to talk about, um, and particularly the doctrine of discovery in the Chilcotin case. And um, I'm going to move back through my own history a little bit to take you there. Um, the work that I was meant to do found me through this maze of beautiful synchronicities synchronicities. I met the late Grand Chief George Manuel, who will be so happy today. I can just see him here smiling at this conversation, which is just, you know, part of his legacy. Um, George was in the neighborhood um, to fight a speeding ticket. I didn't know him. I wasn't looking for work. I went to lunch with a friend who was having lunch with George, and George wasn't um, paying much attention because he needed to go to court to fight his a speeding ticket, and if he lost his license, he wasn't going to do him much good as an organizer. Well, I didn't know anything about Aboriginal or treaty rights, but I used to work for a law firm that did speeding tickets, and I was their lawyer. So um, I knew a lot about speeding tickets, so I went and I fought George's ticket, and not only did we knock his ticket out, we knocked every ticket out in the province that looked like that, and George on the spot hired me to be the lawyer for the West Coast Oil Ports Inquiry. He said, if you can do that for for speeding tickets, well, what can you do for Aboriginal rights? So to the youth here, I want to say, pay attention to what fate is conspiring to hand to you. Go with the opportunities that present themselves. 
Well, George hired me on the spot to be the West Coast Oil Ports Inquiry's lawyer, and that's where we were trying to stop super tankers from taking crude oil up and down the West Coast. You can see that now that we're dealing with Enbridge, things haven't changed much in terms of the fights that continue to repeat themselves. But I wanted to go to the panel where the late Godfrey Kelly was speaking. He was a Haida elder, and he was speaking on the panel about the risks of oil traffic, tanker traffic. And he was talking about what, that, what would happen to the fish and to the fish-dependent indigenous cultures all up and down the coast. And then this dignified, beautiful man, he politely asked the land question. And in my memory, I heard it said a few ways. I heard it said, where is the government's bill of sale? And how did the government get the authority it claims to destroy the fish when the Haida never surrendered our land? And it was like a question waiting to find me. Growing up Jewish, I was a post-Holocaust kid, and I always wondered how could it happen that the loss of life, liberty, and property of my family and the families I love could have happened, could have happened at all, but could have happened under cover of law by a Western democratic society, no less. And if that could, if murder could happen under cover of law, what is that? What is there to stop this from happening to my neighbor? And what is, it, what is there to stop this from having it be that indigenous homelands could have been stolen under cover of law? It was like a moth to a light flame when I heard that question raised. And so I did study law and I practiced it. And we began this morning in talking about some of the in a sense, the legal paradoxes that I worked with in the context of the law that we've moved through and built and, and created. And I'm going to begin with the Royal Proclamation, because the Royal Proclamation was not followed in British Columbia, and in spite of the fact that it also embeds the doctrine of discovery, it also embeds a fundamental legal recognition as a matter of, of international law of the indigenous people's rights to remain in your homelands, your rights to your legal orders, which survive the assertion of crown sovereignty, and then the incremental perfection of crown title and sovereignty through treaties. And that should have happened in British Columbia, but it didn't. In British Columbia, the lands were just stolen fair and square. And I wanted to talk about the other piece of that law, whereas you've got this high principle of British justice, which is lawyers we used throughout the legal debate for your benefit. The other piece of it is kind of what I call the dark side of the law. It's the shadow collective unconsciousness, which is part of the doctrine of discovery. It contrasts with the beautiful connectedness of indigenous laws being about love into this fragmented thought process. It's just just a thought. It's a thought which we've learned to call ego or an egoic thought structure, which is an idea that identifies you or identifies countries as separate and therefore separate from God. Actually, the, um, the dimensions of it, which are at the root of the problem of this thinking is that we're separate from each other, separate from God. We, it lures us to perceive in a loveless state, which is the breeding ground for fear, which is the gateway for suffering. And so in this thought, there's competition with one another, there's, there's superior, inferior. It's a world of illusion where injury to others is part of everyday life because it fails to see larger dimensions of things and it misses the beauty of the encounter. And this is really in our collective unconscious mind of our nation that this, that this superiority of one nation based on the doctrine of discovery and the inferiority of another nation based on the doctrine of terra nullius, that this mental way of thinking, and it is only a thought, can become embedded in not only our collective unconsciousness, because it's not part of our consciousness, and also into legal doctrines which we see um, rooted in the um, words of the court, as the court um, interprets cases which are brought before it. 
So I'd like to spend the remainder of what time I have talking about the recent dark side of the law, the court of the conqueror, um, in the Chilcotin case. And I did a paper called Aboriginal Title Over the Buffalo Jump, which is available for you who want to read what I'm saying so you don't have to take notes. So this is, this is the state of the law in British Columbia. After reserving judgment for 19 months in June, the British Court of Appeal, the BC Court of Appeal, rendered its decision in the Chilcotin case. And there was findings made about Aboriginal rights that are helpful and proper title and right, rights holders. I'm not going to deal with those today. What I want to talk about is what the court did with Aboriginal title. And this is a real heartbreak. I just want you to listen to what the court did. It said that, that Chilcotin asked for a declaration of Aboriginal title and rights over an area which they were protecting against logging. The court said that it sought a practical approach that would clarify the law and lead to progress in negotiations. So it set up two theories. One where Aboriginal title is recognized throughout this territory as a basis of negotiation, and the other which was advanced by the province, which is that Aboriginal title just exists over small spots on the landscape. Over the rest of the title, over the rest of the land, there's Aboriginal rights. But Aboriginal title just simply exists over small spots according to a newly minted test which the court accepted based on the fact that Aboriginal people have the onus of proving title if they're seeking a remedy of title and according to the test which requires intensive occupation and proof of it from 1846, the only place that you can ever meet the test is over small spots. So in a form of judicial legislation, the court determined that for semi-nomadic peoples, which the Chilcotin were branded, reconciliation is achieved by the court finding a network of specific sites over which title can be proven connected by broad areas in which various Aboriginal rights can be exercised. The courts say that Aboriginal rights provides cultural security. And I'm just going to read you the nub of the judgment. I agree with British Columbia's assertion that what was contemplated by the court in Delgamook were specific sites on which hunting, fishing, or resource extraction activities took place on a regular and intensive basis. Examples might include salt licks, narrow defiles between mountains and cliffs, particular rocks or promontory used for netting salmon, or in other areas of the country, buffalo jumps. So the result, according to the court, is a practical compromise that can protect Aboriginal traditions, in the court's words, without unnecessarily interfering with Crown sovereignty and the well-being of all Canadians. So the result for the Chilcotin is that while they can maintain a modest, modest, modest livelihood based on hunting and trapping rights, as soon as the land is used for other economic purposes, the land is suddenly terra nullius and available to Crown governments without, who did not offer even an elementary explanation of the legitimacy of Crown authority and title over Chilcotin territory in the absence of treaty. And you know, I'm going to tell you that when I read the judgment, I, I was triggered. Triggered means that you're caught in um, a, a feeling which takes you back somewhere else. And there was energy from somewhere else there. And where I got triggered to was 1991 when we read the judgment of McEachern. Because in Delgamook, what McEachern found was Aboriginal rights over a broad territory, but Aboriginal title extinguished, except over small spots, which were already re reserves conveniently. And that was exactly the net impact of this judgment. And I just went through my mind how you can give up your time and your peace and your sleep from 1991 to 2010 trying to overturn that judgment, which we did, only to find it back on my desk. And it took me a while to settle down. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now that I'm settled down is to talk about, um, let's look at the system of thought that went into the judgment. How did the, ju how did the court get all the way back there? And so I'd like to turn to the logic and the trajectory of the judgment to search out a path for justice. So I'm just going to take you through the logic of it. 
The Supreme Court of Canada has said on many occasions that the courts must take into account the Aboriginal perspective. In the words of the court in Delgamook, only by fully recognizing the Aboriginal legal entitlement can the Aboriginal legal perspective be satisfied. Well, the court's reference in Chilcotin to the Aboriginal perspective is found in one paragraph, 233, and this is what the court says. The connection of the Chilcotin nation to its traditional territory has both spiritual and temporal aspects that are difficult to convey in the dry words of the judgment. Then the court became speechless in terms of the Chilcotin concept of land. And instead what the court did is it took the opportunity to express its own views about why reconciliation has not been achieved through negotiation. And it referred to the extreme positions, they said, that have been taken on both sides by the governments in saying that Aboriginal title had been extinguished. This is prior to Delgamook. And then he said, and to the extreme position taken by the Gixan and Wet'suwet'en, that they had absolute and complete ownership of their territory and a paramount right to govern it. The court said these positions failed to provide a basis for genu genuine reconciliation. Well, the extreme position that was attributed to the Gixan and Wet'suwet'en by the court was actually the characterization of their position by the Attorney General's office while we were fighting Dalgamook. And the lawyer, the Attorney General lawyer, who was there in the Attorney General's office at the time, is now Justice Groberman, who was writing the majority decision for the bench. And so you see, and this is the um, point that I want to begin to make, is that the Aboriginal perspective was substituted by the perspective of the Attorney General's office that appears as the rationale for why we need to get on with this new um, form of legislative judicial decision about how the land question is going to be solved for the benefit of all Canadians. And I want to ask you, from an Aboriginal perspective, where has it ever been said that your homelands are small spots on the land? Like, where does the idea that Indigenous people just relied on salt licks and fishing rocks and narrow canyons and buffalo jumps for your existence and survival? It defies common sense, and it's very hard to believe that the extinguishment debate that went on for 30 years from Calder to Delgamook was about Aboriginal title not having been extinguished over a salt lick. Like what jurisdictional and economic component is there to a salt lick? And how did cultural security replace the jurisdictional and economic component of title? Well, actually, the court lost its way. And what it did is it returned to two doctrines which have been repudiated in various decisions which we've already argued. The first that it, ar that it returned to is the idea that Aboriginal title exists where it's proven. Just think about it. That's what the court said. Because the test to prove Aboriginal title requires that you prove intensive use, and because that can only ever be done over small spots, Aboriginal title equals small spots. Well, I want to take us back. I just want to just hold that in your mind, that the court said that Aboriginal title exists where it can be proven. And I just want to go back to 1980. And I'm sitting in the office of the late Grand Chief George Manuel, and he's got a brown paper envelope in his hand. And it's obvious he shouldn't have this document because it's a confidential briefing note to cabinet. And in it, he asked us to read it. Leslie Pinder, Mary Lou Andrew, and us were there. And this is what the document said. There is likely to be a major effort by Canada's native people to win national and international support, especially at Westminster, for their stand against patriation. If the native peoples press forward with their plans, and if they succeed in gaining support and sympathy abroad, Canada's image will suffer considerably. Because Canada's native people live as a rule in conditions which are very different from those of most other Canadians, as simple statistics set out below a test, there would be serious questions asked about whether the native people enjoy basic rights in Canada. 
And then there's a long list. Indians have a life expectancy 10 years less than the Canadian average and violent deaths, the whole hideous list of statistics. And then the document says, Native leaders realize that entrenching their rights will be enormously difficult after patriation, especially since the majority of the provinces would have to agree to changes that might benefit Native people at the expense of provincial power. They therefore demand an entrenchment of Native rights before patriation. And at that point, George sounded the, the alarm. He said it was the white paper policy all over again. He said that these changes are beyond consul, consul, consultation, beyond administrative battles, beyond petty politics. In his words, it's hitting at the roots at the very existence of indigenous people. And so the Union of BC Indian Chiefs passed a resolution beautifully stating their position about being having to be inclusive and seeking harmony and cooperation about the nations and then you organize the Constitutional Express. And the Constitutional Express, as you know, went across the country. It picked up support and supporters along the way. And when it arrived, by the time it arrived in Ottawa, Trudeau had announced that he was changing his policy and the Parliamentary Standing Committee, which had previously been instructed not to listen to Indigenous representation, was instructed that they could now hear Indigenous representation till February. And instead of going to the Parliamentary Standing Committee, the Express went to the, off, to the House of, of Governor General Schreier and deposited with him a petition and a bill of particulars demanding internationally supervised negotiations for constitutional renewal and inclusion. And then the Constitutional Express went to New York. The same bill of particulars and petition was delivered to the United Nations and to the, um, and to the governments of Canada. And then the Express headed off to Europe and talked throughout the entire European um, portion of their trip about the um, exclusion from basic human rights and exclusion from constitutional renewal and that Canada was misrepresenting their position abroad and then ended up in London where um, a potlatch was held celebrating um, the relationship with the Crown in a most beautiful and ceremonial and chaotically wonderful way. I just have to say about the potlatch in um, London, I've got a very endearing memory of my son Max, who's now a musician, and he was just a baby at the time, and he had a wooden bowl in his head and a wooden spoon, and he was sitting there drumming the Constitutional Express song in time with all of the singers that were doing it um, from the... Um, it was like the heartbeat of the of the movement to the world, and there my little boy was was there. It was a beautiful event, and it coincided with the parliamentary lobby. I don't know if you'll recall, but we lobbied all of the MPs in the wards. Um, there was over a thousand of them that we visited. Um, this was a kind of chaotically stunning event where chiefs came and supported the lobby every day, and. Um, one story that I'll tell you, I am getting sidetracked, but doesn't matter. Um, it was hard at that point because there was a lot of ignorance about Indigenous people, and we were in a room where um, we were lobbying with chiefs from Saskatchewan and British Columbia, and the Lord, um, we, were in, we were lobbying a Lord, and he was sitting there with his researcher, and he said, where are you from? And one of the chiefs from Saskatchewan pretty typically move forward first to answer and he said Saskatoon Saskatchewan and the Lord turned to his researcher and says they don't speak English <laughs> <laughs> anyways it was a beautiful it was we also brought three court cases I don't have time to tell you I wish I did another day we'll tell the whole Constitution story but I did want to say that when the Canada bill was 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 um, debated it was a debate like no other in Canadian history when the BNA was Act was passed in 1867, the debates were silent about Indigenous people. Like, likewise, silence through each of the 14 times until 1975 when amendments to the BNA Act were debated. But when this Canada Bill was, was, was passed, and this was after Section 35 was included, 
You guys were over there challenge, challenging them in court. You were still challenging the British Parliament. The Constitutional Express was still happening. You didn't think Section 35 was going to be your ticket, and you put on the record that in the most amazing way. And when that happened, at the end of the day, David Ennels summed up what 27 of the 30 hours about the Canada Bill was, was about Indigenous issues. And this is what he said. The Indians are not asking for material assistance from us or for money. They're asking us to ensure, as we promised, that their constitutional status is protected in the renewed Canadian Federation. They have asked us for the constitutional tools to enable them to develop their own nationhood, their own forms of self-government, and to preserve their traditions and their cultures and their laws. So it wasn't so hard. He caught it. The point I'm making about this, and you're probably wondering how this is going to come back to the Chilcotin case. While the Constitutional Express was moving across the country, Section 35 was taken out of the Constitution, and then it was put back in. And I want you to listen to the draft that was taken out. This is what it said. The Aboriginal tr and Treaty Rights of Aboriginal Peoples of Canada, as they have been or may be defined by the courts, are hereby recognized and confirmed. Do you see? What the court in Chilcotin did was adopted a definition or an interpretation of Section 35 that was a rejected draft. The draft that was passed said existing Aboriginal rights are hereby recognized and confirmed. And as soon as that happened, the government said, ah, yeah, existing, it's an empty box. It means extinguished. So the first case that we took to court was the Sparrow case, where the governments went to court and said existing means empty box. And the court said it actually means the opposite. It means unextinguished. And, it hold, and Section 35 holds the promise of rights recognition and reconciliation. So then we fought whether or not Aboriginal title had been extinguished in British Columbia. This is the next 14 years of our lives, fighting against extinguishment of Aboriginal title. And this was the Delgamut case. And it was a landmark case because extinguishment had been the underpinnings of British Columbia's denial of, British, of Aboriginal title since Confederation. And I want to tell you, and this is something about our conference, which I'm finally getting around to, um, to, to hitting your nail on your head, that the governments argued that Aboriginal title had been extinguished, and the doctrines of terra nullius and the doctrines of discovery were the centerpiece of their argument. And these doctrines, as you heard this morning, are fear-based ideas that are found in the cultural imagination of the colonizers and which form modern litigation positions. And the idea in fashion through the cultural lens of the early colonizer was one of a hierarchy of races, going back to what I was saying about seeing yourself as separate and superior. So it's a progression up a ladder of human society staged in an imagined ascent to civilization. And seen through this lens, Western societies are at the very top. They've got a right and indeed a duty to rule and to travel the world planting baby replicas of themselves everywhere. And indigenous people who are hunter and gathered societies, they, they said they're at the very bottom. Inferior cultures who roam the land opportunistically and they don't have real laws. And so, these doctrines were argued in all of their declining alternatives in the Delgamut case. That first, the chiefs weren't really chiefs. They didn't really represent their people. That they didn't really have laws. That if they did, there was never any um, control of their territory. If we're wrong about that, the superior laws of the crown extinguished them. And if we're wrong about that, then they were extinguished by the way the settlers used the grants that were granted to them by the superior laws. This was the argument in Delgamook. And the Supreme Court of Canada rejected all those arguments. They said Aboriginal title has not been extinguished in British Columbia. It has jurisdictional and economic components. There's two authorities over the land coexisting, neither absolute, each constraining the authority of the other, and the court created a robust framework for reconciliation and said 
um, that there's constitutional space for indigenous laws. The court said indigenous laws pre-existed, survived the assertion of crown sovereignty, have never been extinguished, find expression in section 35, and then the Campbell case said that jurisdiction is not exhaustively divided between crown governments. Well, that's where we were in 1998. But Crown governments never liked what the Supreme Court of Canada had to say. They didn't agree with the decision, they never implemented it, and they just turned their mind to overturning it. And they began by, in the um, Haida case, arguing that Delgamook doesn't apply unless you prove it in court, and they lost. The court said that there's obligations on the Crown arising from the assertion of sovereignty, honour of the Crown obligations to make treaties, to implement them, and about consultation and accommodation. Now what happened um, is that, um, and this is the second piece that I want to um, when I talked about there's two repudiated theories, the first is the repudiated theory that I've just gone through that the court adopted, which says that Aboriginal title is based on what you can prove. And you can see the circle around that is really untenable, not even on a reading of section 35, but also on the law of extinguishment. But the second um, repudiated theory was one that we argued in Delgamook, and that is that Aboriginal title just exists over small spots on the landscape, villages, enclosed fields, certain important spiritual sites. And that argument was first argued um, before the trial judge. And the argument was that Aboriginal people voluntarily left their territory in order to live on Indian reserves. And that argument didn't even make it past Judge Justice McEckard. So on appeal, the same lands, small spots, village sites and enclosed fields, only the argument migrated to the definition of Aboriginal title. And what the Crown governments argued is that Aboriginal title is no more than a bundle of specific Aboriginal rights, which if, if exercised intensely enough on certain kinds of land, then the court said, or the, the government said, there you have Aboriginal title. Where is that? Small spots and cultivated fields. Well, that was rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada, who said Aboriginal title has a jurisdictional and economic component. Well, then, the same old land, the same old thought, the same old argument migrated to the onus of proof. And so what they said in Chilcotin, and how this came up again, was that the, in Delgamook, the court said that if a First Nation um, seeks a declaration of Aboriginal title, here's the situation. First Nations prove exclusive occupation in 1846, either by physical possession or laws, um, interference, the Crown proves extinguishment, justification. Well, the province grabbed a hold of that and said, aha, well, you've got the onus of proving exclusive occupation, and they they said, and then they revived terra nullius because what they um, said, well, then if you, if you don't prove it, you've got, we're going to talk about the test now in this case. If you don't prove it, then the land becomes ours, just like that. No other, no, you don't, it's extinguishment by litigation. If you don't prove it, you lose it. That's not the Royal Proclamation of 1763 speaking. This is some new aberration on the doctrine of discovery. And they used the Bernard and Marshall case, which was a case where Micmac and Malaspe people harvested trees and raised an Aboriginal title defense, and the court found that they hadn't proved title based on the evidence of that case, and the province hijacked the um, findings of fact of that case into some legal doctrine about the onus of proof and how you've got to prove intensive occupation, which was accepted by the Court of Appeal. Now you, you know, I'm speaking in a way which is all about the courts, but this is a very pernicious situation because since we've been fighting Aboriginal title issues, the Crown's legal position and its litigation position, these are the positions that remain on the land. These are the positions that are reflected in legislation, in policy, and in government negotiation mandates. So I want to say that this isn't just all about the law. This is about watching the government's denial positions entrench itself on the ground, and they've just got a taker in the form of the BC Court of Appeal that's accepted it for now. 
So I want to, before I get out of this piece about the, um, about the decision, talk about the Jules and Wilson case, because th this isn't the only case talking about reverse, uh, talking about onus of proof, because at the same time as the Chilcotin case is before the court under a cost order, the Jules and Wilson litigation after 10 years of, believe it or not, being before the court and still not having a trial date, and I don't have time to get into the ins and outs of how all that happened, but we've, we've survived five motions by the province to get us out of court. Um, we're still standing. And the important piece about the Jules and Wilson litigation is that under one of those pieces of doctrine of discovery legislation, the forest legislation that says no person shall, shall cut one tree without permission from the province, um, the province brought a stop work order, um, they started the litigation, and they have the onus to prove what they claim, which is that the trees are crown timber and the land is crown land, and that they've got the authority to stop Indigenous people from harvesting trees in the absence of treaty, and we'll just see what happens. And I think that we've got to understand that when I speak about the Chilcotin decision, we're not speaking about it in the context of it being law. We're speaking about it in the context of a legal battle where there are a number of other events going on to shape the law, including the appeal of the Chilcotin case and other decisions which are coming before the court. I want to, um, before I talk about um, um, the next piece, I just wanted to relax, just spend a minute on the stereotyping which is going on in the doctrine of discovery. When, um, when I talked about what happened in Delgamook, you um, heard me say that the Crown stereotyped Indigenous people as being a peoples without laws, roaming aimlessly around their land opportunistically, you know, eating when they were hungry. And, um, you know, stereotyping is part of that mental mindset that I talked about earlier, that illusion, that some, this thought that somehow we're separate from one another and that we behave in this competitive man-eat-man -man environment. And stereotyping has been one of the ways in which basic human rights have been violated for centuries. The Jewish people were portrayed as not being human so that they could be taken by cattle cars to slaughter during the Nazi era. And, you, and indigenous people have been stereotyped in this case, in the Chilcotin case, um, this beautiful, beautiful society who's lived out their destiny in their homelands for thousands of years. The Chilcotin people are portrayed as not having effective control of their territory, just small spots, driven by survival needs and living more by custom than the rule of law. So what the stereotype has is that the Crown governments have rule of law, you guys have customs. Crown government has economy, you have trade. It's just the stereotyping of the inferiority and the superiority already com concepts of society that are embedded in the way they argue. And the court at the end of the day in Chilcotin bought it. They, they described the Chilcotin as, as exercised more or less on an opportunistic basis, that's your harvesting practices, and managing to a limited extent the Chilcotin people are described as roaming over your territory. This is by the BC Court of Appeals speaking. And I just wanted to um, say, and this is such a beautiful moment to have heard Walter this morning talking about um, the opportunity through the international framework, that every concept that found favor with the court has been repudiated on the international scale. The stereotyping has been repudiated by the UN Declaration that says, affirming further that all doctrines, policies, and practices based on advocating superiority of peoples or individuals on the basis of national origin or racial, religious, ethnic, or cultural differences are racist, scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable, and socially unjust. I'm on the UN's piece. And you know, um, this case also runs up against two decisions by the Supreme Court of Canada, which has said that the doctrine of terra nullius is not to govern. 
So the case is running up against repudiated doctrines, it's running up against the UN, UN declaration, it's running up against its own domestic law. And I wanted to, before we talk about the path forward, just spend a minute on this idea of cultural security. I call it home security, because having taken away title from the equation, the court puts cultural security up there through rights as being the way that your title or your cultures will be protected. And I wanted to mention that recently the federal government passed Bill C-38, where it emasculated the environmental review processes, which considered the public interest risks of big projects proceeding. So now we've got big projects wrestled from boards and tribunals and placed in the hands of federal cabinet who's made clear its ideology of glorifying the exploitation of resources in the name of economic growth, regardless of what that means for indigenous people or ecosystems. They've, they, it's, it's the ideology, because of this mental idea that things are separate, the environment can be separate. And they create what I call sacrifice zones, which are areas of the country that's been offered up for exploitation in the name of profit, and that where humans in the natural world are used and then discarded to maximize profits. And so you have to ask yourself, after this environmental review and prosperity mine, which is one of the areas which is the subject of the litigation area, where title was not affirmed but rights were, do you really think that the federal cabinet in deciding whether or not to approve prosperity mine is going to pry into the aboriginal perspective and enforce ancient stewardship laws and give them expression and give priority to traditional livelihood and refuse the project? Well, I don't think so. And then the court says, well, broad territorial claims are not tenable, only claims of title over small spots. Well, if indigenous people can't go to court under any circumstances to seek remedies for territorial title, people will exercise and protect their title on the ground with the supporters who will be there too. And we're going to be in a very different world where peaceful resolution is not in the same domain as where we are at the present time. And I just wanted to make that point because I want to talk about where can we go from here and where are we going. And I'd like to return to the 1910 period, to that beautiful memorial that the Allied or the Interior Tribes sent to Sir Wilfrid Laurier. And I just want to read you a passage of it. They were, this is the part of the memorial when the chiefs were recounting their first meeting with a whole new race of people they had never before known existed. And you can see how their perspective was inclusive and loving and generous. Um, this is the passage. They had made themselves, as it were, our guests. We treated them as such. With us, when a person enters our house, he becomes our guest, and we treat him hospitably as long as he shows no hostile intention. At the same time, we expect him to return to us equal treatment for what he receives. Some of our chiefs said, these people wish to be partners with us in our country. We must therefore be the same as brothers to them and live in one family. We'll share equally in everything, half and half in land, water, timber. What is ours will be theirs. What is theirs will be ours. We'll help each other be great and good. And then they recounted the dispossession and cruel treatment. They demanded that the land question be settled. And they said, so long as what we consider justice is withheld, so long will dissatisfaction and unrest exist among us, we will continue to struggle to better ourselves. And I just wanted to contrast that with the fragmented thought structure that the court in Chilcotin went down, where um, Recognition of title was pitted against the aspirations of other Canadians, like me. They, it's a very insulting way of thinking, where it's in a permanent state of opposition. Indigenous people are strangers, in contrast to the 1910 memorial, where Indigenous people saw the white race as guests. And on a collective level, conflict is extreme and endemic. And this, this pattern of thinking is like a, a sinking ship. If you don't get off, you go down with it. 
And so I want to talk about this challenge that we're at. We're at a turning point. The dream of justice through the courts is elusive. The old paradigm needs transforming. And that's not happened in spite of constitutional reform or in spite of court victories. This isn't the struggle of Indigenous people alone. As a society, we need to figure out how unity and diversity can be achieved. To end suffering, we need to make a break from what we think. Justice is a reflection of our collective consciousness, and injustice is a reflection of our collective unconsciousness. And I just wanted to say that at this time, I really believe that we are in the midst of a global shift of consciousness. Language, which is a vehicle through which the soul of each culture comes into the physical world. Every fortnight around the world, an elder dies with an ancient tongue taken to the spirit world forever. A language dead, the sum total of the ideas and dreams, misbeliefs, thoughts that are encoded in that language. All that intellectual wealth is lost to humanity. And our collective suffering has become an economic disease where worldwide structures around the world are crumbling. You know, um, Gandhi said about the Western society, he said that it's not in its right mind. He said, separated from God, we're separated from love. Separated from love, we're separated from ourselves. Separated from ourselves, we're insane. Where there is no love, there's fear. Where there is fear, there's a life-gripping force that can crush the soul. So here we are. I'm a lawyer. I've been trained in the adversarial system. But I'd like to suggest that while we have some battles to fight in court, this isn't where we're going to win our next moment. This isn't where transformation is going to happen. I thought of that, that great scene in Batman and Joker where ba Joker's got Batman down and he's got a knife to his throat. And Batman says, um, well, kill me then, Joker. And Joker says, why would I do that, Batman? You complete me. And that's a bit what it feels like in court, that as you resist something, it becomes stronger. And I'm going to suggest that you can change things not by fighting the existing reality, but building a new model that makes the old model absolute. And we've already got a beautiful new model built. It's that it's indigenous laws, which are um, the laws of the universe. It's interesting, I was at a conference in Australia where a lot of Indigenous people were talking about Indigenous laws and it just sounded like music to my ears because it's all the same laws that your elders talk about. The earth still holds those laws and Indigenous people's stories still carry those laws and it's those laws which hold the transformative possibility because they carry a different thought structure than the thought structure which is denying it. And so I wanted us to dream together that the human consciousness is, sh is shifting from the ideas that we're living today and that I th I'd like to also um, speak um, strongly about what Walter Echo Hawk said about shifting into a framework of human rights based on the international. In other words, we need a collective strategy. We need a multi-pronged political, legal, international strategy once again where the two paths that I see in front of us that I want to um, close with is the blessing of indigenous laws, which are still our best hope and our most beautiful opportunity, and the opportunity internationally to move into a human rights dialogue, which isn't about stereotypes and racist doctrines, which um, are egoic and are dysfunctional, even to those that are promoting them. So, just to close by expressing my great gratitude to the elders who um, have who have taught to us about indigenous laws by their conduct, 
who are helping us restore our minds to its rightful state and contributing to the energy environment with solutions. We're far more powerful and capable than we give ourselves credit for. Creator, put us in the world of the possible, not the impossible. Thank you.